note, the forum is a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. It harnesses information, convenes stakeholders, and prepares action-oriented leaders to meet pressing health challenges creatively. Tonight, we are video conferencing our medical students from the McMaster Student Council, our McMaster Medical School's satellite campuses at Niagara and Waterloo, in addition to an overflow room that we have downstairs. Uh, this debate on evidence-based medicine is co-sponsored by the McMaster Health Forum, McMaster Medical Student Council, McMaster Alumni Association, and McMaster Student Union's Sponsorships and Donations Committee. At this time, we would like to hand it off to the moderator, our Forum Student Subcommittee member, um, and MAC Debate Representative, Sunit. We also have Dr. Montori representing the opposition for tonight's debate. Dr. Montori is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. He held a research fellowship with the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics here at McMaster University, and his interests are in clinical decision-making in patients with chronic conditions such as diabetes and the relationship between quality of decision-making and patient outcomes. He also conducts research exploring systematic reviews and meta-analyses and evidence-based clinical practice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Montori for the debate tonight. I'd like to remind the audience that the viewpoints expressed by the debaters tonight are not necessarily representative of their personal beliefs and opinions. Now, Dr. Guy and Dr. Montori, uh, a representative of the Student Subcommittee of the Health Forum, Harrison Misnick, will be providing you with time signals for five minutes and one minute remaining. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to begin from behind the podium because there are some slides in which I want to point with, uh, and we've been encouraged to move out, which I will do. And once again, you see the discrepancies in expert recommendations, some recommending, some not recommending. So there was clearly a substantial problem. What was going wrong? The first thing that was going wrong is that this was before the era of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And so the individuals making the uh, recommendations did not have the big picture. A second, what tends to happen to experts is they develop strong beliefs and tend to select supporting evidence to uh, back up their beliefs. And this is how you can have people making absolutely opposite recommendations. The solution is the first principle of evidence-based medicine, which is that systematic summaries of the best available evidence should guide management decisions. But how do we judge what evidence is best? Evidence can be broadly defined as observations in the world, it means clinical experience is part of the evidence, but it's open to bias. When psychologists have studied human reasoning, they find that we easily make false causal connections, we're influenced by the vividness and immediacy of our observations, and we all have small samples. Laboratory and physical re physiologic research is systematic, but generalization is dangerous, and observational studies have uh, non-comparable groups which can mislead us. Examples, hormone replacement therapy for cardiovascular risk, for a decade advocated on the basis of observational studies suggesting reduction in cardiovascular risk. When the randomized trials came out, no such reduction. These antiarrhythmic agents were marketed in the United States before randomized trials showed that they increased, not decreased, lethal arrhythmias, which they were designed to prevent. The drugs listed here all have wonderful physiologic effects in patients with heart failure. When tested in randomized trials, they all increase mortality. And it works the opposite way as well. When I was training, because of their uh, negative inotropic effect, make the heart pump acutely less well, 
Uh, beta blockers were contraindicated for heart failure. We now know that they are the most powerful agent we have for reducing mortality in patients with heart failure as a result of randomized trials. This then brings us to the second principle of evidence-based medicine, a hierarchy of evidence where randomized trials yield stronger evidence than observational studies, basic research, and clinical experience. The other, that's, well, that's the second principle. The third principle of evidence-based medicine comes from considering clinical decision-making. And it's a bit of an ironic third principle, which is that evidence is never enough. It's always evidence in the context of values and preferences. We would all agree that antibiotics are effective in pneumococcal pneumonia, but consider a 95-year-old demented individual incontinent with contractures, uh, moaning in apparent discomfort from morning to night. Nobody's come to visit the individual in their long care institution for the last five years. Such a patient develops pneumococcal pneumonia. Should that patient be treated? When I asked that question at Medical Grand Rounds uh, in North America, 95% of the people suggest no, but 5% say yes. When I asked the uh, question in Victor's home country of Peru, two-thirds of the people say yes, the patient should be treated. When I ask it in Saudi Arabia, virtually everybody says the patient should be treated. We all agree that antibiotics are effective in such individuals. The reason that some think they should be treated and some not is an issue of values and preferences. Papinogrel is superior to aspirin, small superiority in randomized trials, but until recently, virtually all guidelines recommended aspirin uh, over uh, uh, papinogrel. Most atrial fibrillation patients do not receive warfarin, despite its uh, effect on stroke reduction, it increases bleeding. Evidence-based medicine remains the leading force. The understanding of evidence continues to evolve uh, in uh, clinical practice guidelines that I'm going to describe in the second part of the talk, evidence-based health policy and the understanding of values and preferences uh, that influences guidelines and clinical care. Thanks very much. Um, one thing that has happened with evidence that I want you to realize as we hear those very nice principles of evidence-based medicine that Gordon laid out is that the evidence is being generated less and less now by academics and more by industry. And so uh, underlying some of the elements of my talk is the fact that industry, and I've decided that I'm using the term industry to describe any for-profit corporation uh, or for-profit interest that could have at some point in time a conflict of interest with better patient care, which is part of the proposition. Um, one of the challenges there is that the goals of industry may not be the same as the goals of advancing that patient care. And so that trend that you see in this slide of more and more of the research shifting from academic academia to for-profit organizations to industry means that the game is changing. In what ways? And this slide just only highlights the fact that not only is funding moving, but also the citations so that the research that is influencing other research is also being produced increasingly by the industry. In what ways is it influencing the research? First is by introducing bias. Now, thankfully, one of the first things that the EDM movement did was to actually identify the sources of bias in research. And for instance, for randomized trials, you see the list on the slide. Uh, was there appropriate randomization, allocation of concealment, blinding, blocks to follow up, and more recently, the is issue of clinical trials doctor. Um, being in the home turf of evidence based medicine, I'm going to assume you're extremely familiar with these concepts, and if you're not, shame on um, <laughs> um, So, one of the things, however, is that not only are you in, in knowing what are the challenges in relation to bias, but also everyone else. And so when you, when uh, uh, PJ Debro uh, from uh, 
master, looked at the quality of, of Ryan Marshall's and Bob Journals, found that sometimes he was lucky and he was not there. But when you, you look at which studies have the highest methodological quality in terms of what you, how they were reported, what he found was that for profit funded, patient funded, the best quality in terms of bias analysis. So not only did we learn where bias can, could be introduced, but also these for-profit organizations knew how to protect their studies from bias. And so when you go and look for those studies, they appear to be the better of the bunch. However, when Mohit Bandari, also from here, looked, and others have looked, at the uh, relationship between funding and the direction of the findings, he finds uh, overwhelmingly it's more likely that the study will find in favor of a product Made, uh, uh, produced by the funding source of the study than other ones. So how do they do it? So one choice is they know how to, they, they have really good products, and every time they, they, they get to show that it's better than the synthetic made. An alternative explanation is that they know how to ask the question. They know how to present the results. So in addition to bias, there could be spit in the way the question is being asked or it being solved. And we published a number of ways in which things can be introduced. You can compare the wrong patients. You can, you can compare your, your, your intervention unfairly. Another favorite example is an antidepressant that was compared with another one. The control antidepressant produces some, <coughs> makes, you, makes you tired. And so most clinicians use it at night. In that particular study, it was used twice a day. Big difference between the new antidepressant and the old one, more people were somewhat with the old one. So that was set up to fail that way and to make the new product look safer. So you can you can spin the results by by, by you can spin the study by asking the question in a problematic way. You can represent the results using composite endpoints that hide the fact that your intervention does not really impact mortality or other outcomes. It only changes some surrogate markers of interest. And surrogate markers, the use of surrogate markers, is another way in which this happens. Changes in the outcome definitions after the fact. And inadequate and abundant subgroup analysis. And also ways in which you can frame the discussion to make things look better than they are. And this is what this, this study, which was published in Germany in 2003, found. When you look at 370 trials, uh, the idea that the statement of enthusiasm for the intervention was not linked to the quality of the study or the safety of the, of, of the drug or the ethics of the drug. It was linked to the funding source. After adjusting for treatment effects and the of the first effects, it was five times more likely that a study was saying, my drug is the winner or my device is the winner if, um, if, if the study was funded by the maker of that particular device. And then controversies are manufactured in the same way. Uh, we, we got a chance to look at this particular one. Rosie Winterson or Avandia is a drug that is uh, 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 marketed for patients with diabetes. Interestingly, in September of last year, it was pulled off the market in Europe. It was kept in the United States. It was also kept in Canada. Um, we should go ooh. <laughs> Every time you imitate the United States, you go, oh, oh, oh. Anyway, so, so how did that happen? So the fact is, rosiglitazone increases the risk of myocardial infarction by 40%. There are other alternative drugs that you can use to be